Uh, so it is my great uh, pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Virginia Allen Terry Showman, who has been kind enough to come here from uh, Grenoble. Uh, she is a doctor in English literature and a research fellow at the Institut des Langues et Cultures d'Europe, Amérique, Afrique, Asie et Australie, at l'Université Grenoble Alpes. Her recent dissertation is entitled Di Diaspora and Displacement, the Evocation of Traditions, Origins and Identity in Culinary Memoirs and Emerging Literary Genre. Her research and publication are focused on self-writing, memory and female identity. Uh, so thank you very much. The floor is yours, Virginia. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Melanie and the organizing committee for, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. I think this is a wonderful subject for a conference. Thank you very much. Um, my, um, my presentation will cover four main topics. Uh, ambiguous or dichotomous narrative representation of abundance and scarcity, diaspora, humanity, and the American dream. I think that's an important subject uh, when we're discussing American diasporic literature. Suffering and the salvatory nature of discerning taste, and scarcity and abundance and the human condition or existential questions. I... In my presentation, I have included the longest quotations. Most of them are taken from six culinary memoirs and uh, four gastronomical works. If I'm permitted to include Ernest Hemingway in there, maybe I shouldn't, but he's there. And so these are the works I'll be talking about, basically. In approaching the question of scarcity and abundance, I invite you to examine with me an academically obscure, if abundant, hybrid genre, commonly referred to as the culinary memoir. As a form of contemporary American diasporic self-writing, it addresses questions of individual and community displacement, uprootedness, and cultural identity with an atypical device of recipes. As fragments of culinary traditions, these recipes provide a space within the story for remembering and recreating, and weave a secondary narrative within a chronicle of past events. As autobiographical works, they offer literal and metaphorical representations of food and taste through personal experiences of want and plenty, with some paradoxes that offer insight into existential questions concerning immigrant and writer. The genre records an aesthetic paradigm shift from survival to pleasure and from necessity to desire as it relates to food, indicating, I consider, aesthetic centrality to questions of taste in scarcity and abundance. Barbara Frey Waxman wrote an article in 2008 explaining why culinary memoirs are worthy of academic study. And I'd like to share a couple of quotes. She claims it offers, quote, impassioned descriptions of unusual and well-loved comestibles, metaphorical associations that link food with love and emotional nourishment, as well as memories. They achieve the articulate association of food with culture, identity, family, community and cross-cultural experiences not to mention what she describes as vividly descriptive, emotionally dramatic, and often lyrical prose. In 2001, The Guardian ran an article about what the author Natasha May describes as the recent cookbook memoir, Hybrid Genre. Certainly, many cookbooks today carry intimate voices, photographs of culinary personalities, and their domestic interiors. With the publication of personal non-fiction narratives, May quotes Barbara Santish as saying, that we are, what we are seeing with increasingly personal cookbooks is, quote, a continuation and intensification of an earlier trend, end quote. As far back as the 1990s, with the exception of some earlier pioneering gastronomical works, authors were writing about their lives with a warp of family food traditions and a weft of recipes. While the cookbook is a celebration of food, memoirs typically tell stories of past scarcity and present abundance. Authors express pride in an ancestral and community heritage which contributes to the definition of their individual identity. Memoirs oppose and juxtapose the poles of scarcity and abundance and in doing so explore their points of intersection, notably around exile and relationships to origins through food. 
Abundance may be tainted with notions of excess, even decadence, yet also represent infinite plenty and diversity. Scarcity evokes lack, but also the idea of rarities to be savoured. At the core of a harmony between two extremes is the question of taste. Memoirs celebrate the perfect taste, but also the balance between culinary culture and recollections between narr- sorry, poetic narrative and prosaic recipes. Elizabeth Ehrlich's memoir, Miriam's Kitchen, offers an example of this congruous blend of recollection, anecdotal recipes and narrative progression that tells her mother-in-law's story as well as her own, her quest to build a spiritual foundation under her children. Constructing her narrative around the cyclic rituals of the Jewish year, Ehrlich prefaces each month with reflections about her spiritual call to stricter religious observance. She says, drawn to ritual, I may perhaps draw nearer to meaning. Ehrlich describes Holocaust survivor Miriam as, quote, a keeper of rituals and recipes and of stories. She cooks to create a lost world and to prove that unimaginable loss is not the end of everything. She's motivated by duty and an impossible to wish to make the world whole, end quote, and thus find a semblance of healing. Rituals relativize scarcity and abundance, focusing on a quest for perfection and wholeness, which is achieved in literary terms in the harmoniously orchestrated rhythm of the memoir. Taste as now and then indicates appreciation, judgment or discernment and is related to aesthetics. It's commonly considered that taste may be expressed by those who enjoy abundance rather than those who suffer want. Taste is also the precise sensorial distinction and nature of a comestible that represents the harmonious balance between carefully chosen and measured ingredients. Gustatory perfection is a source of dignity intrinsic to the cuisine of diasporic communities and a confirmation of authenticity. It contends with oppositions of lack and completeness, of omission and saturation. Thus taste defines and arbitrates abundance and scarcity from a point I consider of equilibrium. Taste as verb denotes perception and individual experience. The nuances of verbs in recipe instructions, as imperative injunctions for example, must be respected if the ideal taste is to be achieved. Ehrlich's recipe for Schulent, the Jewish Sabbath stew that is placed in a warm oven to simmer slowly overnight for the Sabbath lunch, contains succinct, methodical instructions until she reaches the point of adding the ingredients to the pot. She pauses at a colon and quotes in italics Miriam's own words, lay the bones and meat to the bottom of the pot, as though the verb lay and Miriam's immigrant grammar held the key to the perfect dish. These grammatical nuances of taste as both subject and object highlight the paradox of individual taste representing identity and food taste often representing shared opinion. Taste can be precisely defined in terms of a dish and yet defy definition when related to aesthetics. It escapes the boundaries then perhaps of abundance and scarcity. For the former it may be lost to excess, for the latter it may be forgotten. However, culinary memoir seems to suggest the opposite for reasons of dignity that represent identitarian culinary traditions and the critical equilibrium in all things. West Indian Barbadian Canadian author Austin Clarke captures the search for the perfect flavour of the humble kingfish recipe in his poetic native dialect and whimsical instructions. And to bring out the full flavour of the kingfish, how about making some cucumber prickle? Sorry, I can't do his accent. Slice some cucumber thin, thin, and put them in a bowl. Add a dash of salt, a few pieces of fresh hot pepper cut up small, 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 a generous amount of freshly squeezed lemon juice, and a lot of fresh parley le- pa- parsley leaves pick off and drop in the bowl. Stir all this round and leave it to sit. Amy Trubeck, in her work, <coughs> The Taste of Place, discusses the importance of terroir, which uh, Austin Clark is referring to here, the very soil in which the food is grown. It impacts abundance and scarcity directly and is important from the perspective of Trubeck's statement that, quote, taste is the difference between food as a mere form of sustenance and food as part of life's rich pageant, a part of sociability, spirituality, aesthetics, and more. Our cultural taste colors our physiological taste experiences. 
Taste is both literal and symbolic, representing sensation and cultural identity. Perhaps, as Adam Gopnik, American uh, author, food writer, points out, it's because, quote, the metaphors of taste are so basic that they imbue and infiltrate our entire experience, and we, are no, long- and we no longer think of them as metaphors. Indeed, he goes on, moral taste is often an expanded metaphor rising from mouth taste. The memoirs discuss tasting life intellectually and sensorially, exploring origins and coming to term with want and plenty. So what I would like to show here is that the articulation of values in immigrant self-writing focuses on the importance of taste as a mark of authenticity, as a tribute to memory, as a humanizing quality and sign of resilience, as an ethnic distinction, and as an expression of aesthetics and morals. Cunnerin memoirs often offer signposts to the equilibrium vital to diasporic communities for whom the dichotomy between scarcity and abundance is ever-present in the very essence of their exile, the scarcity they often fled, and the abundance they hoped to find in the hostland. As narrative, plot and metaphor, they exploit stories that consider valued tastes into hardship and of plenty, not as the monopoly of plenty, but as an element of both. Now I'd like to discuss the, the ambiguous narrative representations that we may find in these works. While an abundance of food offers an opportunity for cornucopian descriptions and its scarcity a testament to trauma, taste is sometimes ambiguous. The juxtaposition of scarcity and abundance invites questions related to digestibility, for example, for which I have chosen one of many illustrations. Diana Abu Jabba, in her memoir The Language of Baklava, confronts her confused identity, she's half American, half Jordanian, in her first independent steps as a student when she's no longer able to eat her father's copious and delicious Jordanian fare, especially prepared for her Christmas homecoming. Roasted chicken, shish kebabs, grape leaves, her body repelling the identity of a good Arab girl, I quote, that he wanted to impose upon her. The molten nausea that comes several af- hours after eating is accompanied by an immatur- inner turmoil, a dreadful disorientation, the sense that something is deeply wrong, yet completely unidentifiable. She mourns the food that she loves, even bush before she eats it. It's so lush and lovely. I eat it recklessly like an amnesiac with no awareness of anything but the table, the sweet sadness of return. Inversely, Chinese-American Leslie Lee, writing in her memoir, Daughter of Heaven, finds the American food her Chinese father prepares with bitter resentment just as indigestible. Lee juxtaposes scarcity and abundance with the edible and the non-comestible. Food, of course, the growing of it, the cooking of it, the people who prepared it, the people who ate it, the rituals surrounding it, The events which required it in splendid abundance is the foundation of this book, as surely as rice and vegetables are the foundation of any Chinese meal. As for the savoury stone, which if it's worth if it is worth its salt, should flavour the repast from start to finish from soup to nuts, that must be supplied by the stories themselves. Li's splendid abundance contrasts with the lack implied in the mythical stone soup, whose taste emerges as rich ingredients join stone and water, vegetable joining mineral. The dominant story itself providing the ultimate taste, as in the game uh, where paper enfolds rock. Lee brings a stone, a translucent jade called mutton fat, to Old Man Hill, the oracle, to which they have to bring stones to record to honour the memories of the dead. Arthur, uh, sorry, Austin Clarke's childhood cuisine that he describes with images of rich tastes and lengthy preparations is actually descended from his community's slave origins. He improvises in exile to create the dishes with inadequate ingredients that he calls ingreasements. The overwhelming lexical visibility of the words one, same, identical, which K.K. Dika highlights, referred to the scarcity of food at certain periods in the island of Barbados, but might also signal the various conditions in which the writer cooks. He makes do with compromises and turns them into something innovative, rich, and dense for body, mind, and soul. Poverty required that nothing be discarded, as everything 
could and would be used even the burnt food became a delicacy. I think I have this. The bun bun is the layer of food stuck to the bottom of the pot. It contains in coagulated form all the good things. Clark also describes manipulating the food as a way of enhancing the flavor of poor ingredients. One thing about cooking food that comes from the, the slave days is that you have to touch up the food and love up the food. Slavery inherently implies hunger, which is explored in relation to taste in earlier 20th century foundational memoirs, such as those by American gastronome M.F.K. Fisher and also by Ernest Hemingway, who inscribe its importance within an interwar aesthetic that blurs oppositions, suggesting the intrinsic dignity that may be experienced within either situation. Hemingway's A Movable Feast, which while not culinary as such, contains an abundance of Parisian nourishment, scenes of commensality as celebrations of illusory interwar plenty and representations of emotional as well as, as well as physical hunger. Hemingway's sparse style intones an abundance of food, not in infusive de effusive descriptions, but in the repetition of scenes of eating and drinking, often associated with him writing, symbolic of the ongoing flavorful narrative. Scarcity has an ironic central place in a movable feast. Both hunger and feasting are an integral part of Hemingway's formative years in the 1920s Paris art scene. He appears to live a hand-to-mouth existence, yet bistro fare is omnipresent. For Hemingway, hunger coexisted with feasting, artists treading a fine line between financial precarity and short-lived affluence. He saw the privation of food as a stimulation for creativity. Uh, he said, you got very hungry when you did not eat enough in Paris because all the bakery shops had such good things in the windows. He continues, when you are 25 and are a natural heavyweight, missing a meal makes you very hungry, but it also sharpens all your perceptions. At the Luxembourg Museum, he writes, all the paintings were sharpened and clearer and more beautiful if you were belly empty, hollow hungry. I learned to understand Cézanne much better and to see truly how he made landscapes when I was hungry, I used to wonder if he were hungry too when he painted. For Hemingway, the taste of hunger is aesthetically nourishing. Contradicting M.F.K. Fisher's idea that hunger robs you of your freedom, he argues that it stimulates perception. Like Fisher, however, he, affirm, he confirms the idea of multiple facets of hunger that capture the literary imagination and engender a narrative aesthetic of food. Italian-American writer Louise de Salvo's memoir Crazy in the Kitchen tells a story of her grandmother's solid peasant food from a poor and hungry Italy. She speaks of extreme want but also of honest food that is revered by de Salvo as the authentic taste of her family's homeland. It's despised by de Salvo's mother who considers it a hindrance to her assimilation into American culture. The scarcity of food in Italy is present at de Salvo's ch childhood table during convenience-era plenty. Traditional cooking is a frontier against hunger, but also represents emotional obligation and coerced loyalty in an ambivalent conflict of poverty and richness of taste. In de Salvo's home, the food tasted more of grief and emotional hunger than comfort. She says, <clears throat> Although my mother wanted to like to eat like an American, her food habits recreated the privations <coughs> excuse me, experienced by, by her people in the south of Italy, though I am certain she didn't realize this. For the families of many immigrants, living in America meant that you would no longer be hungry, that you could eat as much as the rich ate in the old world. But in our house, there was no culture of abundance to erase our family's history. The taste of bitterness and anger infuses her mother's cooking. I can taste the rage in her food, she says, and prevents them from enjoying the pleasures available to immigrant families in America in a self-imposed culinary impoverishment. The potential abundance of the American table, Italian-American table, is overshadowed by family feuds. In our relatives' households, eating much and eating well is the norm. It seems to be a way of putting the privations of the past to rest. I'm always startled by the excesses of these meals and the waste. In our family, peasant habits die hard, 
And making do with less, so necessary in the old country, has become a thread that links my family to what was left behind. Want and not the richness um, of taste is their tie to the homeland. Her grandmother's bread is the symbol of all that is authentic from Italy that poignantly embodies her grandmother's humble contribution in America. She describes it as a thick-crusted, coarse-crumbed Italian bread, a peasant bread, a bread that my mother disdains because it's everything that my grandmother is and everything that my mother in 1950s suburban New Jersey is trying very hard not to be. To DeSalvo, the bread is delicious, even though her grandmother must offset the American flour's stale taste with flavorful Italian ingenuity. To compensate for the dreadful flour that she's forced to use, my grandmother uses fresh yeast, a little barley flour and some salt. The barley flour gives some bread, gives her bread some character, some color, some heft. This, together with the warm, bay-scented water, creates food that DeSalvo claims sustains me and nourishes me. The taste of her mother's sliced white loaf defines the limits of deprivation for her grandmother, who asserts that she would not eat it, even if she was starving, and she told my mother so, the one time she tasted this bread, and she told my mother too that she knows what it is to starve and what it is not to have not to have enough food, and that even if she did not have enough food, she would not eat this bread. Though needy, her grandmother's sense of taste resonates with abundance. She gardens with a cousin on Long Island and eats lustily each day, out of reverence for sacred essential food. A life she might have lived in Italy had she not been so poor. I'm quoting here. Uh, she sang songs that praised the gifts of the land, figs, melons, wheat, herbs, wine, songs that blessed the cooking bot, the bowl, the spoon. Ambiguity around abundance continues when De Salvo returns to Italy later in life as a writer and finds herself eating gastronomic meals in the very places where her family had starved. She describes the comfort of the lodgings and the gourmet food she eats, concluding guiltily, we ate too much. Indeed, her family's birthplace provokes a deep sorrow, a yearning that will never be satisfied for respect, harmony and love. Her emotional reaction reflected in the abrupt sentences. We are staying in a converted masseria. It's exquisite, white stone, Moorish architecture, wild poppies and wild daisies everywhere, an orange grove, a lemon grove. We lounge on a porch with arched windows and doors, listen to birdsong, sip wine made from grapes grown nearby, eat prosciutto and cheese panini. There are olive trees that are over a thousand years old here. They look like pieces of sculpture. In my grandfather's time, a masseria like this one was inhabited by landowners, overseers, those who persecuted my people, yet I am staying here as a guest. Her discomfort is exacerbated by the abundance in which she's able to indulge in the land that could not feed her ancestors, emphasized by her status as guest. The delicious food descriptions are delivered with the same humility. These are pastas I do not know, she says. These are pastas my family never tasted. The choice of the word tasted rather than ate calls out that the gustatory quality, uniqueness and authenticity of these dishes she considers herself fortunate to discover. Chinese-American writer Gish Jen's cultural experience is comparable to De Salvo's and I just want to include one quote from an article that she uh, wrote in this collected work. For these conflicts are what uh, came uh, what come with a move such as my family has made from a culture of scarcity to a culture of abundance. My parents were from rich families in China. They were not the ones who ate tree, tree leaves during famines, but a culture intimate with famine is a culture that even in its upper reaches never forgets food. It's a culture that wastes no food at home. I now want to talk briefly about uh, these works and the idea of the American dream. The American Dream contributes to the distortion of immigrant perceptions of want and plenty. America's abundance shapes the identities and practices of its many ethnic communities. These stories, as memorial and imaginative literature, testify to the universality and subjectivity of hunger. To have enough to eat for De Salvo's grandparents was enough of the American Dream. 
A Dream of America was sold to laborers to lure them to America, where they provided the cheap labor needed. During my grandfather's first years here, the dream faded, though he never would trade life in this country for life in the old world. Despite the inhuman conditions that the railroad workers experienced, her grandfather was a railroad worker, they stayed here. Her grandfather jeered at for his filthy, scarcely human appearance, cooks over a roadside grill. A squirrel killed with his slingshot, rubbed with pork fat that he carries in his pocket and cooked with the wild thyme and onions he's foraged, prepared with skill and devotion. Eating the food that satisfied him, not just food that fills his belly. His humble dish is not a starvation ration, but tasty food that gives him dignity. While Hemingway and fellow expatriate artists sought emotional and spiritual sustenance in the old world, others sought physical sustenance in the face of scarcity and even starvation. In applying a post-colonial reading of these works, Vivian Halloran reminds us that for many, America was a destination of choice because it offered the abundance the America, the I'm sorry, the immigrants sought and that first-generation immigrant Angelo Pellegrini describes lucidly in his 1948 memoir. He highlights the antithetical worlds of the starving Mediterranean immigrant arriving in plentiful post-war America. He says, My penure has passed in so many ways responsible for my deep appreciation of the abundant present I can never wholly forget. As an immigrant, the discovery of abundance has been the most palpable and the most impressive of my discoveries in America. Frugality, a central theme of Pellegrini, is not in itself a virtue, but a sign of authenticity and respect for taste and nature. His larder, quote, reflects the tangible results of the immigrant's thrift, his industry and resourcefulness, his high culinary standards, and his instinct for humane living. Respect for taste offers a benevolent quality that makes the simplest meal a feast. It's a testimony that in America, I quote, the immigrant prizes substance above form, the bread is good, the soup is made from sound flavoured stock, the roast flavoured with herbs and larded with olive oil, mounts to the nostrils and invites to the feast. The vegetables simmered in meat juices bear no resemblance to their watery kin served above the tracks. The Um, Italian immigrants lived below the tracks. The influence of hunger shapes human behavior in the host land. Critic Hazia Dina writes, I think I have this quote, powerful memories of food and hunger influenced the way people confronted new realities. The basic nature of American plenty left a deep imprint on the various ethnic food cultures which developed among the immigrants. The promised land End quote. The promised land was far from idyllic and involved many compromises from which they sought reprieve. And I can quote as an example the Jewish communities, such as that of Elizabeth Ehrlich, where the abundance of home cooking and diasporic fellowship were found in the New York Catskill resorts in the mid-20th century. They were a parenthesis in this compromise. They married pre-war East European traditions with the comfort and abundance of American life to their own flavor. The diaspora also had to contend with the American mentality around food, the abundant larder exploited by capitalism, and the Puritan tradition of guilt over eating. And this I'm quoting Hazia Dina. Being impoverished meant knowing viscerally the difference between sacred and ordinary through the sense of taste and the periodic satisfactions of a fuller belly. The diaspora had to negotiate the complex but necessary task of discerning and promoting taste over American abundance to show that they had moved on from wanton starvation but did not blindly embrace the values of abundance and accessibility that influenced American taste preferences. Suffering and the salvatory nature of the discerning taste. Taste condenses abundance and scarcity such that that they're no longer in opposition. Trubeck says taste mediates between the body and culture, or in the words of Austin Clarke's writing in in his ancestral cuisine, both salivation and salvation. When you survey the contents of that pot, 
after you've taken off the lid and opened she up, such a waft of historical goodness going blow in your face, such a strong reminder from the slave days, such a powerful smell of Barbadian hot cuisine is going to greet you that your mouth is bound to spring water and salivate in a contemporaneous salvation of salivation. Individual and collective experiences of suffering are described in the memories of Elizabeth Ehrlich, who I've previously quoted, and Linda Fury, a Japanese-American author. The expansive metaphor of taste is a vital thread of survival for these authors. <clears throat> Among the memoirs I've researched, two scenes stand out for the barbarity of experiences of persecution and starvation described against a decor of food preparation and eating that of Miriam's Holocaust story and the account of Furia's father that Furia's father tells of his war years and his cultural isolation in the American Midwest. In Miriam's kitchen, food represents a form of emotional salvation. Her mother-in-law's family lost lives, homeland, identity and human dignity. Miriam must cook to remember lost relatives, lost home and community. She must reproduce the recipes with precision, replicating flavours to negate abominable crimes. Cooking the authentic tastes of the homeland is a reconstructive approach to dealing with loss. For this reason, Miriam's recipe for egg salad cannot deviate from its remembered formula. Her mother-in-law makes a salad that cannot be altered, a staple of her mother's restaurant in Poland. Quote, it's an egg salad transported, egg salad rescued from a vanished past, end quote. Miriam's unspoken duty, her means of survival, is to recreate in the kitchen the world that was lost. In remembering is forgetting and a new creation, a moving on, what Ehrlich describes as she learns Miriam's recipe as a voyage of discontinuity and connection. Discerning taste honours the humanity, dignity and resilience of each individual. The chapter in which Miriam tells her Holocaust story carries the innocent title, Cake. The story she tells is intervo interwoven with the dialogue of a cake-baking session with her daughter-in-law, Elizabeth. She describes the events that destroyed her world while the cakes are, be are baking. Life is thus affirmed in the kitchen in her cooking gestures. All that is left to Miriam are culinary rituals that create the balance between want and plenty, providing sufficient comfort for the story to be told and heard. To live, we bargained for food. We sold our jewellery to buy potatoes and bread, bread and potatoes. At 15, I was no more a child. And then without a pause in the, in the narrative, cake is not all Miriam can do, figuring to delight those she loves. There are other desserts. Luxurious cake contrasts with the repetitive potatoes and bread. She has a vast array of dessert recipes as well as an abundant stock of sweets for the grandchildren that are a poignant arm against the trauma, contrasting with the privations of the Holocaust. In a cupboard under the telephone, Miriam may keep chocolates for the children, Israeli candied orange peels or lightly frosted wafers, hard candy maybe, M&Ms, just in case things aren't sweet enough. I blush now to think of Miriam waking from nightmares, sleepless at dawn, with nothing to turn her hands to and then no sweets to offer her only grandchildren. We were deported to Chesuchova in June or July 1944. We were lucky to be going because whoever escaped got shot. Ehrlich frames the narrative within the Jewish calendar. Quote, each holiday, bringing, each holiday brings its own special offering, an apple cake for Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, dark, moist honey cake to break the Yom Kippur fast, end quote. The trauma of starvation and loss must be assuaged by cooking and eating in rhythm with the seasons. The paradoxical dichotomies, the juxtaposition of life and death, want and plenitude, hunger and abundance, destruction and creation, domination and banality are unrelenting, but skillfully blended into the aesthetic of the diasporic memoir like ingredients into a bittersweet cake. The revelation of her father's death is juxtaposed with an affectionate invitation to her grandchildren to eat cake. Later, they took my father away to Buchenwald. He was very sick and hungry. He died a day before the American army came. Eat a piece of cake, Mamele. Nem, cookie. 
Oi, Sashena. What shall I bake for the next week? Bake for you next week. Uh, these are Yiddish terms of endearment. An ultimate paradox expressed in this and the following quotation associates despair with hope, that of negative absolutes uttered the, within a world of choice and possibility, of total loss distilled in a scene of abundance. Nothing is wasted here, I'm quoting. Nothing is wasted here, not an object, not a motion, not a bit of paper, certainly not a bit of food. Miriam pours oil, a lot, straight from the jar. It's a luxurious gesture. For a moment we are in a land of peace and plenty. While taste is the perfect balance of ingredients, the dedication to its pursuit is limitless. Miriam bakes to excess and keeps an abundance of treats so that neither her ch grandchildren nor her ancestors will ever want. If Ehrlich shows that present abundance is destined to heal past suffering, for De Salvo, quote, there was no culture of abundance to erase our family's history. De Salvo endeavours to rectify this through her own cooking with care, attention, reverence and discipline. With each perfect meal I can make, I can undo the past, undo the that my mother couldn't feed me, undo her fury at my grandmother, undo my father's violence, undo my ancestors' history. I act as if through this alchemy at the stove, I can erase the past instead of reliving it. These examples speak of emotional necessity stemming from childhood trauma. Children also observe the traumas of their parents, and we talked about post-memory earlier this morning, as Japanese-American Linda Furia watched her father foraging for food in the bin, she learned the truth of her past. Dad once told me that after he experienced starvation, hunger by comparison was bliss. Her mother explains, your father was a POW, prisoner of war. He'll eat anything. He'll, he's never full. Furia listens to the story of his POW days at dinner. Quote, over Japanese-style salted salmon and grated daikon radish. Her father describes a hunger that heightened his sense of smell, drawing him into a guessing game with the other prisoners over the, scents, over the origins of the scents coming from the guards' barracks. Quote, when the wind blew from a certain direction, he could make out the mouth-watering aromas of cooking meat and baking bread, drifting towards him from the nearby village like music. Imagination, a slither of salvation. Furia struggles to listen to his starvation story, gorging herself to deflect the unendurable words. Quote, I was shoveling the rice, vegetables and seafood into my mouth while, while Dad talked, unaware of how and what I was eating, engrossed in the same way I would be if I were eating popcorn at the movie theatre during a scary movie. Her father teaches her a moral lesson about hunger and need. After being in the prisoner of war camp, when you, when, when you never knew the next time you would eat, I changed my thinking. Eat your favourite first. If you wait too long, it won't be there to enjoy. Enjoy the best first, he told me. Enjoy the moment. Furious family secures its precarious connection with its homeland at each meal through their Japanese diet, which is put into jeopardy each time their supplies run low. The basic ingredients of their cuisine <clears throat> arrive every few months in much-anticipated packages from Japan or must be collected on long, carefully planned odysseys to Cincinnati or Chicago with specially prepared recipients, white cloth bags, coolers, a sort of quasi-religious pilgrimage. During those early years, my parents monitored their Japanese food supplies carefully. The worry of running out nagged at them. Mum checked and rechecked her stock of dry Japanese foods. Japanese home cooking had become the only daily thread my parents had to their culture. Even I knew that Japanese food symbolized something greater than subst su sustenance. It was like a comforting familiarity that assured me that they could make it through the daily challenge of living in a country that was not their own. Both Ehrlich and Fury expressed the anchoring that taste offers in culinary practices the preparing and cooking of traditional recipes, the bodily grounding and mental comfort of taste memories in the distancing of starvation. Memories, me memoirs such as Miriam's Kitchen are part of what Marion Hirsch and Leo Spitzer described as, quote, the powerful memorial aesthetic that has developed around such vestiges from the European Holocaust. 
Ehrlich was no doubt familiar with Cara da Silva's 1996 edited Holocaust collection of recipe memories, In Memory's Kitchen, a legacy from the women of Terezin. As material remnants, they serve as testimonial objects of their attempts to imagine pre-war abundance, taste memories serving as a testament to the prisoners' resilience, the will to survive in the face of death. They returned in their imagination to their families' kitchens. Uh, these are the prisoners in the, in the concentration camp. Uh, exchanging recipes reconstructed from memory, creating menus and even table settings and imaginary tea parties as their mental, mental arm against starvation, abundance in the face of annihilation. In less extreme circumstances, writers express even gratitude. Pellegrini is springing from his intimate and early knowledge of hunger and survival. Experimentation and the purging of all culinary prejudice are crucial to the development of what he calls a humane attitude towards the dinner hour. Both within and beyond trauma narratives, we appreciate <clears throat> that taste both the dish and the savoir vivre are signs of civilization and culture. Memoirs describe cooking as a humanizing anchor for the diaspora, who Levi Strauss has explained have lost everything and wander in a culturally ambivalent no man's land often with culinary traditions alone to connect them to their former identity. Levi Strauss insists on the metaphorical dimension of the raw and the cooked, the cooked, the society and culture as opposed to the primitive subsistence. Indeed, MFK Fisher writes of the freedom, self-respect and humanity she finds in savouring good food, even in times of war. I could eat what I wanted and spend all the time I needed over a piece of pâté truly to savour its uncountable tastes, I can protect myself with that same gastronomic liberty and eat quietly, calmly and with special dignity. It's often saved me and my reason too. And I move on to my final short section on the human condition. Taste as a marker of aesthetic and cultural values is concerned with survival and immigrant preoccupations with assimilation and authenticity. Anne McCulloch expresses the vital existential dimension of taste. She says, taste as we know it, isn't, as we know it is not innocent metaphor. The acquisition, preparation and consumption of food is alongside those other intimate aspects of our shared material culture, one of the central means by which social status is performed and measured in consumer society. Culinary memoirs affirm and amplify this discourse on the spectrum of scarcity and abundance. Carol Cunyon's 2004 anthropological work on food and community in Italy is revelatory of the complex opposition between want and plenty. She observed in a, in a Florentine study group which had known hardship that modern times had bought a brought abundance, but the bittersweet side of that abundance was the loss of longing. For, the, for these people, everything to do with food was important and interesting, even in hardship. Uh, she says, tastes were rich and delicious, smells fragrant and pungent, hunger strong and deep. They recognized a transition from poverty to well-being rather than scarcity to abundance. For the community, food changed essentially in quantity rather than composition in the post-war years. Yet despite that, they felt that gaining in quantity they had lost in taste. Some of that sensitivity and taste stimulus emanating from the poverty that had been lost with the arrival of plenty. Indeed, sensorial food appreciation embodies a certain cultural integrity. Using language to cre recreate sensory experience, food writer Elizabeth David shared her Mediterranean culinary odyssey on her return to England in 1946, inciting readers to experience the sensual plenitude that she had known even in times of scarcity. David sought to revolutionize food tastes and habits with her uncompromising crusade for luscious ingredients that were virtually unattainable in Russian-stricken Britain. She compares the British diet of flour and water soup seasoned solely with pepper, bread and gristle rissoles, dehydrated onions and carrots, corned beef toad in the hole, with her abundant 
Mediterranean pantry. She says the ingredients which make this cookery so essentially different from our own are available to all. They are olive oil, wine, lemon, garlic, onions, tomatoes, and the aromatic herbs and spices which go to make up what is often so lacking in English cooking. Variety of flavour and colour and the warm, rich, stimulating smells of genuine food. Recording her recipes was a way of preserving and sharing her memories while serving, most importantly, as an antidote to the culinary misery of 1950s Britain, emphasised by the evocation of tastes of aromatic herbs and rich, stimulating smells. MFK Fisher was equally uncompromising in her defence of taste. Like David, she also wrote about eating well in times of want in her wartime memoir cookbook, How to Cook a Wolf. Um, I second quotation, I believe that one of the most dignified ways we are capable of to assert and then reassert our dignity in the face of poverty and war's fears and pains is to nourish ourselves with all possible skill, delicacy and ever-increasing enjoyment. Scarcity does not oppose abundance when there is taste and savour. The recipe, the memoir recipe book form preserves memories and articulates a discourse focused on gastronomic sensuality and gourmet sensibility, a narrative abundance of taste. And with that, I come to my conclusion. And I'd like to uh, read two quotations from um, Massimo Montanari's work on famine and abundance in Europe <clears throat> that he wrote in 1995. He said, The dream has come true. Cocaine is conquered. Finally, we can afford to live from day to day without the anxiety of having to conserve and accumulate. Fresh seasonal food that only now and not in the past can reach the table of as many people as possible. In this End quote. In this fantasy land that served as the antidote to the fear of hunger for many medieval peasants, food is unlimited and easily accessible. Despite this assertion, Montan Montanari believes that the fear of scarcity is still present in today's society. The irresistible attraction for excess, which a millennial history of hunger has etched into bodies and minds now that abundance is a daily reality, is beginning to hit us. In rich countries, diseases due to overeating have gradually replaced those caused by deficiencies. One excess has been overtaken by another. A cordial and conscious relationship with food remains to be invented. Abundance will allow us to do this with more serenity, serenity excuse me, than in the past. I suggest that this cordial and conscious relationship can be constructed through stories at whose heart lies individual cultural identity and taste. In terms of genre, the abundance of food stories offer a plethora of examples in the reconciliation of scarcity and plenty. Adam Gopnik, I will quote here, he says, The old question, what the what's the recipe for, gives way to what's the cookbook for. And this existential crisis has moved the cookbook towards the memoir, the confessional, the recipe as self-revelation. As it grows, the recipe book is always reaching back towards the hearth, towards telling a story. Memoirs serve as examples of stories of food and taste, scarcity and abundance, both nostalgic and traumatic. Gopnik further claims that we have moved not from efficiency to waste, but from famine to abundance. To which I would add that where taste is a mark of resilience, where there is respect and consideration for authenticity and culinary traditions, even in times of scarcity, there is, at the least, an impression of abundance. Food stories bear witness to taste's power to make whole, even in times of hardship. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Vivian.